gardening is the ultimate endurance sport. <laughs> you never quite reach the finish line. <laughs> but I thought we'd talk about gardening and, and soil and how that affects plant health and how plant health affects our health. And the reason I thought we could do that is because um, as Cheryl mentioned, we're still gardening, but it's getting to the time when we're thinking about putting our gardens to bed, right? And when you do that, you want to think about soil health, and you want to think about it for next year as well. How many people here garden? Oh, look at that. We must be in Maine. Yeah, uh, <laughs> a lot of gardeners. And, and you, I'm sure some of you know more about part of this topic than I do, but it's a constant study with me. How can I improve the soil to improve the plant's health? And, and what we're finding is if the soil is really healthy, then the plants resist disease. Have you found that out? If the soil's really healthy, you don't need the pesticides. You don't need the herbicides. Uh, and if the soil is really healthy, you don't have to worry as much about watering because the soil holds the water better. Uh, but you stop and think about that and you say, well, if I give the plant the right nutrition, it's healthy. What about me? If I get the right nutrition, am I healthier too? And the answer is, of course, yes. If you think back about what agriculture has done over the last 60 years, we've done the same thing in agriculture as we have in human health. Uh, for years, if you got ill, you went to the doctor and you got something in a bottle called a pill, right? Or a medicine. And you just took the medicine, you figure, well, now I've killed that and I can go on about my business. If you have blood pressure, you go and you take an antihypertensive. But does an antihypertensive cure hypertension? No. Does a fungicide cure the fungus on the plant? No. It may knock it back, but it doesn't kill it. If your tomatoes get blight, what's the problem? Is it, well, blight came this year? No, blight didn't come this year. Blight's always there in the soil. Well, why do some tomatoes get it some years and others not? What, what are we doing to prevent the illness? And, and I'd like you to think tonight about this, this concept. Disease or pests aren't an evidence that there are too many pests or diseases in the, in the world. It's an evidence that the plant or the person isn't strong enough to resist the disease. If you have a plant, if you have a tomato that has blight, you shouldn't ask yourself, well, I wonder why this is, I didn't spray it enough with enough fungicide. You should ask yourself, what nutrients is it missing so that it's become susceptible to this ailment. And that's a different concept. Uh, usually in conventional farming, they add nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, and then pesticides, or you know, herbicide, or fungicide, or some side, something that kills something, instead of saying, Hmm, I wonder why my plants are susceptible to this illness. And I, I want you to think about those things while we talk tonight. And I'm going to start with the subject of glyphosate. And some of you have heard me talk about glyphosate before. The reason I choose this is it illustrates a point. And that point is plant nutrition is critical for plant health. So glyphosate was first introduced uh, or discovered in this country in the 1960s and it was first uh, patented as a chelator to clean boilers. Now what do boilers get in them? Well they get scale or calcium deposits and, and different metal deposits 
and glyphosate uh, was used to chelate those deposits and clean the boiler. And it did pretty well, but it didn't really take off in the market, and so the company that had developed it kind of cast it aside. And then they found that that chelator also had antibiotic properties, and Monsanto picked it up and uh, patented it as an antibiotic. But it wasn't a really good antibiotic, and so uh, they had some of their scientists working with this compound, and one of them found in the late in the early 1970s that it was a pretty good herbicide. It would kill plants. And so they marketed it first in 1974 as an herbicide under the trade name Roundup. Anybody's heard of Roundup? Yeah. So glyphosate is the active ingredient in Roundup. <clears throat> there are actually quite a few other active ingredients in Roundup that are called inactive. It's interesting, if you drink uh, glyphosate, just pure glyphosate, you can get by drinking about a half a cup and only 50% of people that drink a half a cup will die. So it's got an LD50 of a half a cup. And that's pretty non-toxic for uh, a weed killer. You think, wow, that's, no, that's toxic. No, it's pretty non-toxic, really. But if you add in all of the other components, it's much more deadly. Uh, so although they're called inactive ingredients, they're really quite active and they make glyphosate work better. And so glyphosate or Roundup was used as a weed killer, but um, it didn't really hit big time until the 1990s. What happened in the 1990s is Monsanto figured out a way to genetically change plants so that they could be resistant to glyphosate's effect. The way glyphosate works in plants is it blocks the shikimate pathway of protein synthesis, and we don't have that in our bodies. And so that's why it's relatively non-toxic to us, but plants do have that. <clears throat> and if they can't make protein v via that uh, chemical pathway, they die. And so they develop corn with a workaround, that enzyme pathway, and actually soybeans first in 1996. They developed soybeans that you could spray with glyphosate and they still grew beautifully. And this was a real uh, leap forward because now farmers could just spray their field, kill all the weeds, plant the soybeans, and then spray more glyphosate as the soybeans grew, and all the weeds died, and you had a beautiful field with nothing but soybeans in it, and, and that was a real advance, quote. And then in 1990, thank you, Cheryl, 1998, they did the same with corn, and <clears throat> GMO crops took off. In fact, 90% of GMO crops today are GMO specifically because of glyphosate. They're glyphosate resistant, and so you can spray glyphosate on the field, and it won't kill the plants. It just kills the weeds, uh, at least most of the time. Now, plants have gotten smart, too, and have become glyphosate resistant, and so we're using other weed killers and starting to genetically modify our plants to resist those as well. Uh, then around 2000, they found that glyphosate could be used in another way, as a plant desiccant. That is, it would kill the crop if it wasn't Roundup resistant, but that had some benefit. For instance, here in Maine, we grow a lot of potatoes. And one of the things we do is we spray those potatoes with glyphosate right before harvest to kill the plant. And that, in that, when you kill the potato plant, it hardens the skin on the potato, on the tuber, and so they're much less uh, likely to be damaged in the harvesting process. And so now we're using glyphosate as a desiccant we found not only does that work for potatoes, but in wheat as well. If you, before you harvest the wheat, if you spray the wheat with glyphosate, it kills the wheat, 
and it brings the kernel of wheat to a harder shell and it can be harvested a little bit earlier. And so we find that glyphosate is sprayed on wheat and on oats a lot. So we find those are the major crops that are, uh, we use glyphosate with corn, soy, wheat, oats, and potatoes. On corn and soy, it's because of Roundup resistance or glyphosate resistance and weed killer. It uh, helps people do a no-till method, which is a good method, uh, but not with this use. And so we, we find uh, that this can be really helpful in the growing of crops with several caveats. Number one, World Health Organization several years ago and then again last year uh, found that glyphosate was a carcinogen, at least probably a carcinogen. And those of you that follow the news know that uh, Bayer bought out uh, Monsanto and their stock fell after a case in California this year where a, um, a groundskeeper at a school developed cancer and uh, the jury awarded him with a 289 million dollar settlement because he had had tremendous exposure to Roundup uh, as a groundskeeper and it developed a cancer which seemed to be at least scientifically directly related to that exposure. Well, Bayer's stock fell when that happened, and understandably because there are thousands of cases waiting in the wings to be tried, and now they have a precedent case. But I would like to set aside the carcinogen effect of glyphosate, although that's there and I, I believe it's real, I'd like to set that aside for a moment and ask ourselves another question. What does glyphosate do to our soil and what is the effect on the plants as a result of that? <clears throat> Remember, we're looking at glyphosate as a case. It's not the primary thing I want you to take home today. I want you to take home today a way of looking at the soil. So remember glyphosate was first marketed or patented as a chelator. Well, what does a chelator do? A chelator, the word chelate, comes from the Latin word crab. And it just means to grab onto. If you can picture a crab with the nice big claws, it can grab on and hang on. If you've ever had a crab pinch your finger when you were little playing with it, you know they can really grab on. Well, a chelator, is something that grabs onto something. Particularly, we use it when we're talking about a substance that can bind, grab onto minerals. That's why they used it in boilers. It chelated the minerals in the boiler and helped clean them. Boiler. In the soil, it does the same thing. It chelates or binds minerals and makes them not available to the plant for use. So we find when we use glyphosate over years it tends to build up in the soil. If you look at uh, the data on gly glyphosate it's interesting. People will tell you that it has a half-life in the soil of about 60 days, 30 to 60 days. But if glyphosate is bound to minerals it can last in the soil up to 20 to 22 years. So if you use it over time and it binds minerals, it's going to bind more and more and more minerals and then the farmer in order to grow the crop has to put more and more and more minerals on to, bind, to fill up the sites on the glyphosate and still have some uh, available to his crop. So you can do a soil analysis and the soil analysis says there's plenty of minerals in the soil but they're in a bound form that's not available to the plant. And uh, then the plant becomes more susceptible to disease because although the minerals are there, it can't get the minerals, and the minerals are necessary for the plant to develop re disease resistance. And so now we have to use more fungicides and more pesticides to keep the plant from dying. So you see that glyphosate is having a lot, 
bigger effect by its effect as a chelator. But remember glyphosate also has another property. It's an antibiotic. That is, it kills life, particularly bacteria and fungi in the soil. And you say, well, that's good. We should sterilize our soil, of course, and then it won't have disease in it. And uh, that's great. It's sort of like me taking you and saying, if you don't want a cold, I'll put you in a sterile environment. Well, you won't get a cold in a sterile environment, but it's kind of lonely. <laughs> yeah. And it's hard to grow plants in a sterile environment for very long, and it's quite costly. And so, again, there must be a better way than killing all the soil bacteria and all the soil protozoa and all the soil you know you don't stop to think about it very often but there's a big difference between soil and dirt soil is alive good soil is in fact in a teaspoon of soil there are more bacteria than there are people on the earth and in one teaspoon of soil, there are 50 to 100,000 different species of organisms. That's a lot of different kinds of bugs growing in there. 50 to 100,000 different types in a teaspoon of soil. So soil, naturally, is very alive. And it's interesting, if the soil is dead, truly no living things in it, just the minerals, just the dirt, the only thing that will grow in it is weeds. And weeds grow in the soil to bring back the bacteria. And after weeds grow for a while, if you, if you have a garden and you let it go, Weeds grow the first year, and the second, and the third. What grows next after weeds? Bushes, right? Well, do bushes need a different kind of soil than weeds? Yeah, they need more, not just bacteria, but more fungi. And after a while, trees start to grow. Why is, this, why is there this progression? because as nature rebuilds the soil, different types of species can grow. And the ultimate progression of soil, the healthiest soil, is found in a good healthy forest because you've shifted from just bacteria to a complete array of bacteria and uh, the mycorrhizal fungi and that sort of thing. So you get, you get a whole living soil again. And we take glyphosate and we do what? We kill this stuff. And as a result, as I mentioned, we need more pesticides to keep the plants growing. But what effect does that have on us? Because if you eat a tomato, let's say, that's grown in a hothouse, can you tell the difference between a tomato grown in a hothouse and grown in your garden? Why is that? The reason is it doesn't have the polyphenolic antioxidant concentration that one grown in your garden has. Now what's polyphenolic antioxidant? Well that's what gives it color and flavor and aroma. And it's interesting, the better it smells, the better it tastes, the better it looks, the healthier it is for you. Because we find that these polyphenolic antioxidants are really necessary for us to resist disease. And I'm going to come back to that in a, in a moment. But let me just uh, go on a little bit more. Why are plants that are diseased, why are they diseased? Well, let's talk about those polyphenolic antioxidants. Those are the compounds made by the plants that help the plants resist disease. 
You see, bugs are nature's garbage collectors. Bugs don't usually bother healthy plants. And so if you see a plant that's having problems with an attack of bugs, the first question you have to ask yourself is not where is my pesticide for this pest, but I wonder what's wrong with this plant. What deficiency does it have? Now here's an example. There's a company that uh, you may have heard of. It's uh, Advancing Eco Agriculture. It's run by John Kempf, who's an Amish gentleman that uh, I've met and talked with. He was at a conference that I went to. And uh, he, uh, several years ago, was asked by a uh, tomato grower in this area to come and look at his greenhouse. At the same time, backyard greenhouses had a similar problem. It was a white fly infestation. And for a while, backyard uh, tomato growers in this area shut down their entire operation and sterilized their uh, greenhouses because they could not get rid of the white flies. They might have been better off to call John Kemp. He came to one of backyard tomato growers' comp competitors. They had three large greenhouses. All of them had white flies. And he went in and he did what's called a plant sap analysis, where they take an old leaf and a new leaf and then uh, blend it up and extract the plant juices or sap and compare them and see, is the plant deficient in anything? He found that the, plant was de the, plants, the tomato plants were deficient in nickel and uh, he prepared a foliar spray and then sprayed one greenhouse, the one in the middle. Within three to five days, all the white flies left. They didn't die, they left. Why? Because the plant now had the nutrient necessary to make the polyphenolic antioxidant that made the tomato not tasty to the bugs. And they left. They were still in the other greenhouses, and then he sprayed those and they left there too. So it wasn't an absence of pesticides that, that, uh, that caused the problem. Just like when you get a pneumonia, it isn't an absence of antibiotic that led to that, it's your system wasn't strong enough. And when you get that pneumonia and you finish that antibiotic, you really need to ask yourself, why was my system weakened? What was it? nutritionally or environmentally that made me more susceptible to this urine infection, this whatever infection? Why is it that I have coronary artery disease? It's not just genetics. It's environment too. And it's what we're eating and how we're living. See, this all ties together and it ties together around the health of the plants as well as the environment that we live in. So when you're dealing with plants, I, I want you to think about, you gardeners, hmm, I wonder what's wrong here. How do I need to improve the nutrition in the soil and the life in the soil? The interesting thing about plants is this. They make carbohydrates, right? Sugars. Where do they put the most of the carbohydrates? Into the part above ground or the part below ground? They put most of the carbohydrates that they make into the roots. 70% goes into the roots. Why does that happen? To feed, to feed the life in the soil because there's a very close connection between the bacteria and the fungi in the soil and the plant. The nutrients in the soil are not well absorbed by plants, but they develop a coating of bacteria and beneficial 
fungi around the rootlets and those organisms provide the nutrition to the roots in a way that the plants can absorb. And so the plants feed the microorganisms and the microorganisms feed the plants. And so when we use glyphosate to kill the organisms, what did we do to that symbiotic relationship? We destroyed it. And then we had to use more and more nutrition called fertilizer. Now, one of the things that we've had to do is we've had to add nitrogen. Is there a lack of nitrogen in our world? No. How much of the air is nitrogen? A lot of it. The majority of our air is nitrogen. Why do we need to put it in the soil? Because we've killed off this beneficial relationship between the plants and the microorganisms. There are plants called nitrogen fixator, fixers, clover, legumes. They take nitrogen out of the air and they put it into the soil with the help of the bacteria and the fung fungi. Interesting. So there's not a lack of nitrogen. How about phosphorus? Well, there is if you put it on like we've been putting it on. In fact, some people will tell you that there's only 35 years of phosphorus left in the world. Estimates vary. It goes from 35 up to 400, depending on who you believe. The outer limit of that is 400 years of phosphorus. We cannot do agriculture like we currently are without phosphorus. And uh, we have quite a bit in this country, probably about 2 to 10 percent of the world's reserves of phosphorus in this country. The place that has the most is Morocco. Uh, but even there, if we continue to do agriculture the way we are, not caring for the microbiome of the soil, that's the living structure of the soil, we're soon not going to be able to support life here the way we are now. So can we change things? Yeah, you can. There's a whole movement now called regenerative agriculture that is seeking to bring the soil back to life. And if you do this well, you can grow plants without pesticides. That's called organic growing. And you can grow them without those herbicides. And you can grow them without added fertilizer. Soil is not deficient in any nutrients. Soil has plenty of nutrients for the plant if you reestablish the relationship between the little organisms there, the bacteria and the fungi and the protozoas and the microarthropods. You reestablish that and then the plants thrive. Have you ever seen anyone fertilizing the uh, forest? No. It seems to grow just fine. Why? Nature does a pretty good job of taking care of itself if we leave it alone. Now the forests around here are suffering because we've done other things to them. Acid rain and sea levels rising on the coast are causing some of the pine trees to have problems because the salt is moving up into the soil. But apart from that, if you get a little higher ground and you leave it alone, there's a natural progression and the soil gets healthier and healthier. Now, we've talked about glyphosate. Are there any other practices that we do that disrupt the, uh, the living soil? the health of the soil. Yeah, it's called tillage. You take your rototiller out there. I love my rototiller. <laughs> but I'm probably not going to use it much in the future. Why? You're disrupting all of that living structure. We have to rethink this and ask ourselves, how does nature do it? And we know now through some really interesting work 
that if we follow the pattern that nature sets up, that actually yields go up, and more, as importantly, the polyphenolic antioxidant capacity of the plants go up, and as that happens, the, the fruit, the produce, looks better, smells better, and tastes better. So I'm, I'm going to ask Cheryl to uh, pass out a handout. You can give me one of those. And this is just recommendations that I have for you as you think about some of these things we've covered. One, think about soil health and care for the earth and it will help to care for you. Many civilizations have come to an end because they didn't care for their soil. And it, it, we're headed that way unless we rethink how we grow things. Uh, remember that healthy soil grows healthy plants. And when people grow and eat healthy plants, they grow healthier too. Now you notice I said when people grow and eat, because the best exercise is probably gardening. I uh, had a teacher when I was in college, David Neiman was his name, and he was ahead of his time, and he decided to divide the class into two. Half of them would garden, they weren't given any power equipment, and half of them ran and jumped and played games, and at the end of the semester he tested to see who was the uh, most fit, you guessed it, it was the gardeners. So uh, grow and eat uh, your plants whenever you can. Uh, that's really important. You know, if you don't have a garden, you can make a really nice container garden on your patio or on your front porch. Uh, you can do a lot with that. So uh, they, in World War II, they had victory gardens. Anybody remember those? All right. We should do some more gardening, not just for victory, but for the planet health and our own health too. Here's another one. Eat low on the food chain and organic when possible, particularly of soy, corn, potatoes, oats, and wheat. Now why do I say eat low on the food chain? Well, glyphosate has been found in the breast milk of almost every woman ever tested in this country. It's been found in the urine of the vast majority of people tested. It is ubiquitous, and glyphosate is concentrated. If the cow eats uh, soy or corn that had glyphosate in it over its life, it gets more and more of that, and then when you eat the cow, you get that, and you get this biomagnification of toxins. So eat low on the food chain, and organic when possible. Does or do organic foods still have these pesticides and herbicides? Yes, they do, but much lower levels, and that's important. Grow some of your own food whenever possible. Know your grower when possible, and eat as close to the garden as you can. Why? As soon as you pick the fruit, some of those polyphenolic antioxidants start to deteriorate. And so as time goes on, more and more do. Eat close to the garden whenever you can. Uh, you can grow greens in Maine in an unheated greenhouse all winter long. I've done it. And then you've got real quality vegetables. They don't grow well uh, in uh, January and February. They sit there, they're okay, you can harvest them, but they take off again in March when there's more sun. So you can have greens all winter long here. Um, choose colorful fruits and vegetables. Use lots of herbs and allium. What's allium? Garlic, leeks, shallots, onions, chives. Those are packed with the polyphenolic antioxidants. It's what gives them the flavor. And herbs, the same thing. Curcumin is uh, in turmeric, and that is a potent polyphenolic antioxidant. You know, it's important to remember, though, you can have all of those micronutrients in the soil, but if they're not bioavailable to the plant, through it 
giving it to the plant, it won't absorb it. You know what? The same thing is true by and large with us. The majority of the nutrients that we need are poorly absorbed in pill form. You can take a multivitamin all your life and be deficient. In fact, it's far better off to get vitamin D from the sunlight than it is from the pill form. All of the benefits of vitamin D that we've seen from the sunlight are minimized when we take it in a pill form. That's true with all of the nutrients that there are. If you can get them in their natural form, just like the plants, the way nature designed it, you're going to be healthier than if you, instead of having nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, you eat carbohydrates, protein, and fat, and then take a multivitamin. Same idea. Eat the plants in their natural state and you will be much healthier. And if the plant's healthy, you will be healthier. So very important. Uh, aim to strengthen your body to resist disease by thoughtful eating and living rather than just taking a medication. You know, I deal with the issue of cholesterol over and over again. And uh, there are these wonderful medicines called statins, and they have made a, a great deal of difference in the disease that we get from cardiovascular, you know, atherosclerosis. Statins work, but they also cause diabetes. There is no free lunch with a drug. I have patients that have come in to me, I think of one of them, he diabetic, hypertensive, coronary artery disease, he would not change his diet. He was on 200 units of insulin, he was on 80 milligrams of atorvastatin, he was on three blood pressure medications, and he still had to have stents placed. His feet still went numb from his diabetes. He still didn't want to change his diet, but after his four-way bypass, three years after his two stents, he said, I think I better listen. <laughs> he is no longer on any insulin. He's off all but one of his blood pressure medicine. And you know, he's feeling better and he looks a lot better. You're far better off to eat thoughtfully and strengthen your body than just take pills. Pills can be very helpful. They're sort of like a crutch. When your leg is broken, you may need a crutch. But if you're still using that crutch 20 years later, we got a problem. Okay? So think of medication as a crutch that you may need, but whenever possible, try to deal with the underlying problem. It's very, very important. So go home and think about your gardens. Plant a cover crop, it's not too late. That will really help the microbiome of the soil. And you know, speaking of microbiome, there's all this microbiome talk about our own guts. Why? Because if you buy your vegetables from the local supermarket, most of them are irradiated to kill all the bacteria so that the plants will have a longer shelf life, but then you have a shorter shelf life. So anytime you can get your produce locally or grow your own, you're going to have no problem with your microbiome. You'll get it from the soil. If the soil's healthy, it will have the right microbiome from you. You know, there's an old, old book, and it says in it, From dust thou art, and to dust thou shalt return. Do you remember that? <laughs> We're really close to the dirt. <laughs> and we need to take care of it because as long as the dirt is more than dirt, it's living soil, we're going to have a better time living too.